uh, I'm the editing chief of Jack Asia. So this is the first episode of podcast from beginners to masters on our new multimedia web page, Jack Asia Pulse. So the page will have four sessions, Grand Wrong, Asian in Medicine, from beginners to masters, and the masters of video. So we hope this platform could be a quick and an easy way to access Asian cardiology content. And uh, also a tool for our younger cardiologists and the investigators to pursue uh, their uh, career. So today uh, I'm so delighted to have Dr. Uh, Imberity and uh, his mentor, Professor Leap, to join us. So Dr. Imberity is a cardiologist at the Department of Cardiology at Jing the Ospedale Law University uh, Polyclinical uh, Modena. And he used to be an honorary research fellow at the University of Liverpool and the Professor Lips mentorship. So most importantly, Dr. Imberity is our Czech Asia 2022 Young Author Awardee. So we invite Dr. Imberity and Professor Lip to discuss their career and the training in cardiology and the importance of researches about aging population. So first of all, Czech Asia 2022 Younger Author Awardee. Congratulations, Dr. Imberity. So Dr. Imberity, please tell us uh, a little bit about yourself. And so where and when did you receive your residency training? So now you have been a cardiologist. So how long have you been a cardiologist? Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, Wang, for your kind invitation. And uh, my name uh, is Jacopo Imberti. I'm an Italian cardiologist and I trained uh, in Modena, Italy, under the supervision of uh, Professor Giuseppe Boriani. During my last year of residency, I had the privilege to spend some months in Liverpool studying atrial fibrillation and clinical arrhythmias uh, supervised by Prof. Gregory Lipp. At present, I'm a PhD student and uh, I work uh, jointly between Modena and Liverpool, uh, while in the future I would like uh, to pursue an academic uh, career. Okay. So, so why did you choose the cardiology as your subspecialty? So how and why did you choose Professor Lip as your mentor? Well, uh, I chose uh, cardiology as my specialty at the second year of the medicine school. I was uh, studying for the general physiology exam and uh, I felt in love, if I might say so, uh, with the cardiology part. Thereafter, I never changed my mind and I became a cardiologist. Um, I chose Prof. Gregory Lip as my mentor during my residency. At that time, I was uh, mainly studying atrial fibrillation and uh, my chief in Modena, Professor Giuseppe Boriani, encouraged me to go abroad in order to widen my training. And we chose Prof. Gregory Lip as one of the most prominent uh, scientists in the field. And Prof. Lip did me the honor of accepting my request and also taking uh, care of my training. Hi, Professor Lip. What's wrong? Hi. Hi. May I ask you uh, some questions? Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, so how many students have you trained so what is your secret in cultivating students? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think in terms of higher degrees with regard to uh, PhDs or uh, if clinical in the UK system, the, the um, uh, MD or Medicine Doctorum is actually a, a doctorate, actually a higher degree uh, in the UK. So um, about 50 or 60 uh, so far. Uh, so that's, uh, as Jacopo is aware, there's a nice shelf uh, in my office uh, with all the, uh, as I 
as I call them, my family, my academic family uh, over the years. And it um, is very much that kind of uh, philosophy with regard to cultivating the students, because I think it's uh, a very much a, uh, you could say, a, a very flat uh, sort of organizational management type uh, uh, structure. You know, I always tell the students, uh, my students, that I very much hope to learn from them as much as hopefully they learn from me. Uh, hopefully, Jacopo agrees that was uh, a reasonable approach. Uh, and I think uh, it's always nice to uh, be engaging, listen to the students. Clearly, they have as uh, ideas and uh, ways to approach a topic. And I suppose um, the way I see it is that is also you could say that it's uh, from uh, it's nice to brainstorm ideas and to actually propose uh, different ways of looking at a particular question. And this I hopefully brings out the best in uh, the postgrad students. And secondly, uh, as I mentioned, you know, rather than students, as I as I call them, they are my academic family. Oh, good. Very good. Hi, Dr. Imberley. So, so what do you think uh, is the best advice given to you by Professor Lee? Well, uh, this is a, a very difficult uh, question, I would say, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if I have to pick up just one thing, I think Prof. Lip has an outstanding knowledge of the data that are currently available in literature, and he is always one step ahead in understanding the future research directions. And taking this uh, as a reference, uh, he taught me a solid and robust clinical research method, and also how to look into data in innovative ways. And I think uh, uh, this is one of uh, the things that uh, are, have been most useful for me. Oh, thank you. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, what, what your study? Introduce us to your, your, your research. Another difficult question, actually, but uh, I would say that at present my studies uh, focus on uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, atrial cardiomyopathy. And uh, I'm interested in understanding the determinants of atrial fibrillation, its natural history, and the factors associated with arrhythmia recurrence and the outcomes, and all this with the perspective to uh, improve patients' prognosis. Okay, so uh, as a PhD student from UK and also you are working in Italy, so why did you choose a Chinese cohort to validate? the utility of ABC pathway? Thank you for your question. Well, the atrial fibrillation better care pathway is a decision-making strategy, streamlining a holistic approach to atrial fibrillation care. Uh, a refers to avoid stroke with anticoagulation, B to better symptoms management uh, with a decision on rate and rhythm control, C to comorbidity and the cardiovascular risk factor management, uh, including lifestyle changes. And several reports uh, have confirmed the benefits of an ABC pathway adherent management on hard clinical endpoints in different clinical settings and the patient's population. However, no real world study was explicitly performed in the Chinese population. And uh, therefore, we tried to address uh, this uh, knowledge gap in particular. Oh, good, good. So, <clears throat> so what inspiration uh, did Professor Lip uh, give you during topic selection process? Prof. Lip uh, was uh, was crucial uh, in the topic selection process. Uh, uh, Prof. Lip identified the knowledge gap. He pointed out that uh, this was an important topic uh, with the potential to improve uh, everyday clinical practice uh, and also to positively impact on patient prognosis. And bearing this in mind, uh, I followed the plan and uh, I made the analysis and uh, drafted uh, the paper. Okay. Good. Good. Hi, Professor Lee. Yes. So, uh, as a 
British scientist. So also why are you interested in researching the Asian population? Uh, well, that's a great question. Well, um, I'm I'm also Asian and I'm actually originally from Malaysia. So I think it's uh, really important that uh, in due course, when I get my atrial fibrillation, I want to know what to do. So I might as well start learning uh, about the, the topic and the condition and how best to manage um, the, um, the, the atrial fibrillation and well, for that matter, other cardiovascular conditions in the Asian population. And I think this is important because um, certainly for, um, in, in the past, many of some of the uh, publications and knowledge has been very much based on Western populations. We are now in the era basically of, um, you know, globalization, you know, there's, um, you know, migrations, lots of um, uh, ethnic minority uh, populations uh, in UK itself. So I think it's important that we understand or know how to actually manage um, conditions um, in Asia and also more importantly Asians in non-Asian countries as well because I think this is how ultimately uh, the uh, the knowledge base uh, increases in terms of uh, managing such patients and that's important given the differences in the uh, risk factor profile and some of the other uh, sort of int outcomes which are different between uh, Asians and non-Asians uh, and how also they respond to different drug therapies. Thank you, thank you Professor Lip for your answer. So, um, so are there are any differences in uh, the epidemiology and the treatment of atrial fibrillation across uh, different uh, ethnic groups, uh, especially uh, the risk of stroke and the bleeding among Asian and the Caucasian. Well, what the possibly there? Uh, what are different possibly? Thank you. Well, I, I think definitely so because certainly some of the uh, there, there are many risk factors that are in common across the uh, you know, Asians and and Western populations with regard to the epidemiology of atrial fibrillation. Uh, some things uh, remain fairly. Um, you could say, um, um, as expected, uh, on a population basis, the impact of hypertension as a precursor or hypertension burden as a precursor to incident atrial fibrillation in Asians as well as Western populations, and also atrial fibrillation related complications, particularly stroke, dementia, etc. When it comes to stroke risk, um, or, or rather, uh, is a stroke with regard to um, some of the ethnic differences. Well, in terms of um, the proportions, the proportion with hemorrhagic stroke uh, is higher in Asian population compared to non-Asians. And that's seen in data, whether from uh, from different parts of the world. And I think the one of the uh, ongoing pieces of work is actually trying to address that question, uh, actually investigating the, the, some of the underlying reasons for the differential proportions of ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke between uh, the uh, white European population and uh, East Asia particularly. This bleeding issue is problematic in the sense that um, on various antithrombotic drugs, whether anticoagulants or antiplatelets, uh, certainly we see for some of the observational data and to a degree also from subsets from the larger trials that uh, uh, Asian patients seem to be more sensitive to antithrombotic um, agents. Uh, in fact, a number of us um, from including uh, uh, colleagues from Asia as well as um, thrombosis or anticoagulant or antithrombotic uh, experts from uh, the uh, so a number of Western countries put together a position paper on the East Asia paradox with regard to uh, the impact particularly on ethnic differences in bleeding as and balancing that against thrombosis. So it's a fascinating area. It's not it's not really a one size or one drug fits all. I think it's important we do understand some of these ethnic differences in epidemiology as well as management as well as this as well as the risks particularly of stroke and bleeding and the sensitivities towards antithrombotic drugs okay um, <clears throat> so 
uh, this kind of differences, uh, are these differences is, uh, related to the genetics or maybe related to the BMI, different BMI in population or to social economically? So I, I think it's multifactorial actually, because I think uh, if you uh, looking at the data, I think it's, it's um, there's a degree of um, gen genetic differences in relation to responsiveness to anti certain antithrombotic drugs like antiplatelet drugs. Uh, however, uh, I think risk factor profiles and one area of research uh, we have been really interested in, and Jacopo was part of that too, is how multimorbidities tend to cluster because uh, we tend to look at let's say in AF patients and we look at a risk factor and traditionally the analysis has been to look at a risk factor in a rather binary manner so say it's diabetes yes or diabetes no but in reality the diabetic patient and atrial fibrillation patient with diabetes will very often have associated heart failure or renal impairment or vascular disease or previous stroke or heart failure and all of those are not simply a statistical adjustment because I think those particular factors per se, they all also contribute to the adverse outcomes in these patients. And we have to, uh, what we're trying to see is defining multimorbidity uh, clusters. Uh, now, multimorbidity also goes with health inequality. So that's that social economic element to this. And social uh, economic aspects are different in different populations. And we certainly see this in some of the uh, Asian data, but we've also been looking at this in the Danish registries and elsewhere, uh, how some of these actually relate to incident AF or AF related complications. So it's a fascinating area. Uh, and I think it's important uh, and highlights the issues about rather than simply, uh, you know, a one size or one treatment or one risk factor uh, fits all. It's not like that at all. Okay. so. What is about the uh, differences in, in the blood pressure control rate uh, between the UK and uh, China uh, in, in urban populations? To, uh, based on your research data, well, what do you think? Um, well, I think um, it's uh, what what I think we see in uh, many UK or European populations, and what we also see in China, there are uh, again um, very much regional differences uh, with regard to how well risk factor control is achieved. Uh, and I think that goes again with the heterogeneity uh, in 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 our management of our patients. And and whilst guidelines are there, or, or we have the ambition to try and give a unified or homogeneous approach as per the guidelines. And don't get me wrong, guideline adherent treatment is associated with the best outcomes. Uh, nonetheless, we still have these uh, differences between uh, urban and rural. These differences between different populations and subsets. So one of the very exciting projects um, I'm currently co-PI uh, together with many um, uh, enthusiastic colleagues in Nanjing is actually to do a study in rural China in the villages. And in the villages, uh, this is where healthcare is delivered by village doctors. We are running a study. Well, firstly, we were looking at atrial fibrillation screening and detection. And secondly, we are in the process of running a clinical trial, cluster randomized trial to look at interventions based on the ABC pathway to improve the management of these patients in rural villages in Jiangsu, Jiangsu province. So uh, this is, uh, this, I think, it's nicely to highlight that we can actually try and deliver um, uh, a package of care or good clinical care even to even to patients out in uh, the rural community, which I think have been neglected in some of the big randomized trials. Okay, I know you have a, a lot of a collaboration with uh, Chinese cardiologists and doctors. So uh, I know you are doing a big study about the uh, atrial fibrillation epidemiology study in China villages. So ho hope for uh, wish you a big success in your studies. Uh, uh, also, I uh, so uh, what what other areas do you believe are worth researching in the Asian population? 
So besides the, the atrial fibrillation. Well, I, I think um, whilst I have a lot of uh, a personal clinical and research interest in atrial fibrillation, but it also extends to um, wider um, cardiovascular disease and beyond, uh, because atrial fibrillation, you could argue, is the manifestation of quite a number of um, uh, conditions. And, and of course, there's a big growth in area in cardio-oncology. And of course, some of the cancer treatments predisposed to atrial fibrillation. The link between, it, between atrial fibrillation and heart failure is clearly there. And I think um, the, if you want to also look at the, the cardio-renal syndrome, where atrial fibrillation also is a, is, a, is a outcome. So whilst I have that focus on atrial fibrillation. Actually, within the Liverpool Center for Cardiovascular Science, uh, we actually have many streams of work that actually go into all those uh, ancillary uh, topic areas that not you could argue are not traditionally uh, just focus on the heart per se. Uh, in the Asian population, that still applies because I think uh, there are some of these areas that are you could argue are under-researched in the Asian population. And uh, this in terms of um, its applicability to uh, the global um, Asian community, because Asians, Asian, you know, in terms of the Asian populations, it's not just in Asia, because there are many Asian population in Western countries. Uh, so it's probably worth addressing the topic of uh, cardiovascular disease and stroke in the broadest sense in many Asian um, pop people in non-Asian countries, like me, for example. <laughs> you know, I want to know, uh, as I mentioned, how to manage myself in due course. <laughs> thank you, thank you a lot. Okay, uh, now I move my question to uh, ask uh, Dr. Imber Imberdi. Uh, uh, what is your next research direction or uh, career direction? <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Barely. Thank you for your question. Well, at present, I'm about to finish my PhD, and in the future, I intend to continue clinical uh, research in cardiology and uh, pursue an academic career. But also, uh, I would like to continue working with my two mentors, Prof. Giuseppe Boriani and Prof. Gregory Lipp, and uh, they recently won a Horizon 2020 grant as co-principal uh, investigators. And the project is on applying artificial intelligence to define clinical trajectories for personalized prediction and early detection of comorbidity in patients with atrial fibrillation. And the topping is quite complex, as you can easily understand, but amazing for me. And I can't wait to start working on that in the next future. OK, where are you joining the Professor Lipp's village study about the in China about the uh, HF fibrillation? Well, if uh, he invites me and, okay. uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe it's a secret. Provides me <laughs> an adequate funding, <laughs> I will, of course, join the project uh, okay. with pleasure. <laughs> this, trial, this trial is called Miracle AF and has been done with my good friend, Professor uh, Chen Ming Lung and Dr. Ming Fan Li in Nanjing. Uh, and they've done, they've, they've it's uh, we reviewed the prelim data just uh, recently and uh, it's really going on track. It's a really nice study and I think it's uh, a unique study because it actually, as mentioned, is it is actually in rural villages and these are these are patients uh, with uh, atrial fibrillation who are hardly represented in randomized trials because we go by randomized trials as the as the gold standard for evidence. But actually, these are not including these kind of patients out in rural villages. So we are really excited by the study. Good, good. Hi, Dr. Uh, Imberia. The one more question is, uh, what advice uh, do you have for younger PhD candidates for, for the aging, especially for aging PhD student candidates? Well, I think the PhD is a unique and a standalone experience compared to the remaining part of the career of a physician. And therefore, I suggest to get the most out of it, not only in terms of scientific publications, mm -hmm. uh, which are, of course, important, 
but also as a working experience that has the potential to put you in contact with many researchers from uh, different countries, Asian countries, Western countries, and uh, broaden your views, uh, thus uh, making you a better researcher. So enjoy the PhD is uh, the most important advice, I would say. OK, thank you. So uh, the last uh, at the last I'm going to ask one question for both of you. Uh, so what advice do you have for Jack Asia? After you, Jacopo. <laughs> OK. Well, what advice uh, for Jake Asia? I think uh, Jake Asia is uh, a very interesting and uh, uh, novel uh, uh, journal which uh, recently appeared, but uh, which is exploring uh, issues uh, which were a little bit uh, neglected years before. And I think uh, that uh, uh, an important part uh, that JK Asia can uh, make and the role uh, which uh, JK Asia can play is to uh, bring out uh, the issue of managing Asian patients across the world. Because as Prof. Lip said before, uh, Asian patients are not only in Asia, but uh, with the globalization, there is uh, there are Asian patients uh, in Western countries, but also Western patients in Asian countries. And so to mix the culture and improve the knowledge on uh, heart diseases worldwide is of paramount importance as uh, we will face this challenge in the next future. And as physicians, we must be prepared to deal with heart diseases in general and not with a cluster of patients uh, themselves. OK, thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Imberti. Uh, so what is your idea, Professor Lee? Well, uh, I, I should point out I didn't plant any ideas for Jacopo's response there, but uh, they're very much aligned with my views because I think it's important that Jack Asia address Asians in the, not just in Asia, but in non-Asian uh, countries. Uh, but I would also add to that that Asia is so huge. So uh, there's a lot of uh, nice nationwide epidemiology data coming from East Asia, but that doesn't necessarily apply to, for example, South Asia, Asia, Pakistan, where some of the data is a bit more sparse. Clearly, it's even more sparse in some of the Central uh, Asian countries as well, because I think I think it's really important that we try and have uh, address all of that. Um, the in terms of the global agenda, clearly there's um, Asian um, pop populations in many countries. Uh, Liverpool has the oldest Chinatown in in England, and uh, we of course. Uh, have that uh, you know that link that uh, in uh, Jacopo's visited uh, the Chinatown in in Liverpool when we when uh, he was here um, and uh, well for that matter even the, in Liverpool apparently we have the best pizza outside of Italy uh, in Liverpool <laughs> as well so uh, I think that's why the Italian fellows are really uh, happy about that uh, joking aside it's also the opportunity to um, get a global view of Asian uh, cardiovascular research. And I think Jack Asia has a very important role to encourage that and facilitate that. And I think uh, it's uh, very much looking forward to future collaborations and developments in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lip and uh, Dr. Imperity uh, for your, um, <clears throat> for your uh, great comments for promotion of Jack Asia. So I, yes, I, I fully agree with your idea. Uh, so uh, about the Asian population study, not just uh, in the Eastern Asia, but we need to do more study in the other areas of Asian countries. But also we, it's, it is very, uh, it is very, maybe very valuable to study uh, Asian population in non-Asian countries, but also uh, reversibly, a reverse, a reverse. We can study some 
other populations in Asian countries. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, mm. not, so uh, actually, your idea and ex expand our scope. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Also, I would like to take the opportunity to really appreciate you for your great contribution to Czech Asia. And uh, also um, looking forward, you are further engaged <laughs> engagement in the in the journal. And uh, thank you a lot for spend time uh, with us, with the audience. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> this is the first uh, session uh, from beginner to masters um, of uh, Czech Asia parts. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>